Bill Mahana was raised on a Holstein dairy in upstate New York. He has a bachelor's degree in animal science from Cornell University with a master's and a PhD in dairy science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And we won't hold that against him either. <laughs> Bill, Bill has been with Pioneer for 35 years and is currently the global nutrition sciences manager. He also serves as an adjunct associate professor in the animal science department at Iowa State University. The American Dairy Science Association awarded Bill the 2014 Nutritional Professionals, Nutrition Professionals Award for significant contributions to the field of applied dairy nutrition. Bill has offered over 200 popular press articles, including penning columns in Feedstuff Magazine and Hordes Dairyman. The Pioneer Global Nutrition, Nutritional Sciences team, with Bill, which Bill leads, is responsible for, for providing technical support for Pioneer dairy and forage specialists, overseeing on-farm field trials and nutritional troubleshooting. So Bill comes to us uh, with a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of experience, and uh, we're going to go ahead and let him kick off tonight's agenda. All right. Thanks, Gail. <clears throat> so I just wanted to, you know, cover five things real, real quickly. The first one is don't chop healthy plants too early. And uh, what this slide is really showing is that traditionally we've looked at that, you know, for bunkers or piles we've looked in that 30 to 32% dry matter. And that would correspond to about a quarter to a third milk line. Um, and, and what we're advocating today, if the plant is healthy, that we push that out a little bit to maybe 36 to 38% dry matter. So we're targeting here three quarter milk line as being kind of the sweet spot. Now I know we can't get it all put up at, at the right time. Um, I mean, yes, we can if we if we really look at how many acres we can plant in a day, how many acres we can harvest a day, and then work in during our pre-planting planning sessions to uh, to look at maturity differences in hybrids. But I know that's that's kind of a tough thing to get pulled off. But um, if we get over about 38% dry matter, that's kind of the danger area I've got there in red. Um, that's when it's going to be more difficult to pack it. Um, there's more chance that that um, we have foliar diseases come in that can um, really reduce fiber digestibility or you know potentially have a frost which we know can reduce fiber digestibility and make the crop more prone to fungi infestation so um, but again it, we we know that a lot of nutritionists have said that 30 to 32 percent is the sweet spot um, because they want to have optimum fiber digestibility well what this slide really shows is, and this is from 127,000 data points, is that fiber digestibility in a healthy plant does not really decline. Now, if it's diseased, yes, but in a healthy plant, it stays pretty flat. The difference between 45 and 47 is not statistically significant, nor is it significant to a cow. Um, so the flip side is, if you leave that plant in the field every day, it can lay down upwards of a full percentage point of starch. So if the plant's healthy, it'd be like shutting off a lactation at 200 days. Uh, let, let's let that plant photosynthesize and continue to lay down starch. Now, again, if we get disease coming in uh, and the plant starts to cannibalize itself uh, or we get tar spot or northern, um, you know, foliar diseases, then we've got to really go in much quicker. But again, in a healthy plant, wait a little longer. I just wanna make a comment about droughted plants. Um, don't high chop droughted plants. Um, that's when we need the most yield is when we have droughted plants. And, and uh, you know, droughted corn silage will feed about 60 to 70% as, as well as normal corn silage, even though there's really not much starch in it. And that's because the fiber is gonna be very digestible and there's gonna be a lot of residual sugars in the plant that didn't get translocated into starch. Um, but the problem with it is there's just not much yield. So we really don't wanna compromise our yield problem already by high chopping. And the reason for that is, is a lot of people say, well, high chop to reduce the nitrate problem. Nitrates are a problem if we've got, you know, wintering beef cattle grazing on stalks, that can definitely be a problem for nitrates. But in terms of fermentation, if we put it into a bunker or a pile or silo, we will reduce that nitrate level by about half. Uh, you can even be up to, you know, 4,000 parts per million, which is pretty high uh, in terms of, of nitrates. But after fermentation, it'll be below 2,000. And especially if you adjust cattle to that slowly, there's not much of a problem. I've been doing this for going on 45 years total uh, between Pioneer and the University of Wisconsin. And um, I've yet to run into a nitrate issue um, with dairy cattle and fermented corn silage. 
Third thing is, uh, again, what we really wanted to focus on today, pay, pay close attention to chop length and kernel processing. So in terms of uh, chop length, there's really no ideal chop length for corn silage. It really depends on you know, what other forages are in the diet and how much corn silage is in the diet. Ultimately, what we're interested in is what's the particle size, the physically effective fiber of the whole TMR. But typically, we'll chop at about 19 millimeters for corn silage and anywhere 15 to 19 for haylage to ensure we have adequate fiber. Some really interesting research um, by Miner Institute um, has shown that it, it appears that particle size seems to influence eating time more than it does rumination, causing the cow to chew or cut. And what they're suggesting, and I have some nice data, I don't have the time to go into it, but I uh, attached it there at the bottom. And I also have a website to Hay and Forage Grower where you can look up the article, but um, they're suggesting, you know, corn silage be chopped no longer than 22 millimeters. And because what happens is cows will, will tend to kind of chew to a constant particle size uh, before swallowing. So very long particles uh, in the diet where we think we're, you know, really improving scratch in the diet. Well, we may not really be doing much at all for that, but we're actually uh, prolonging the eating time, which is something we do not want to do. Kernel processing. So if we're, um, if we're chopping longer, let's say we're, we're chopping, and back to the chop length, you know, there's a lot of, been a lot of work done with shredlage in, uh, in terms of, of chopping, you know, uh, 26 out to 32 uh, millimeters. Um, and Randy Shaver at University of Wisconsin did a number of study, good studies in that. Um, again, I, I still think if we, we're learning more and more about this all the time, shredlage is a great processor, does a fantastic job. But I think even if I had a shredlage unit, I probably wouldn't go much more, much more than 24 millimeters uh, chop length. So if we're chopping longer and we're harvesting more mature kernels in order to capture more starch, we got to be. Uh, it's getting important to have these kernels adequately processed. I'll show you an example. This is a pictures from a dairy in Russia that I visited uh, four or five years ago. Probably won't be going back anytime soon. But um, they had absolutely perfect silage management. Um, they wanted to feed cows like uh, we feed in the Midwest. They wanted to feed, you know, 70% forage, and they wanted about 70% of that forage to be corn silage. They had a heck of a crop. They had the right number of pack tractors, the right number of push tractors for their chopper. You can see they had plastic down the wall. They just did, you know, they had oxygen barrier from. They did everything right except processing. And when I checked it, uh, those you can see the big pieces of of cob and then circled and, and the whole kernels or half kernels and come to find out that the uh, chopper was uh, three years old and never the roller mill had never been changed. So we know there's a lot of factors in influence processing the chop length. If you chop it shorter, we're going to, the roller mills are going to do a better job. How worn out are the roller mills? I used to always talk about roller mill gap, you know, getting it down to that one millimeter for, for mature kernels. Um, but what I've come to realize is that the roller mill differential is probably just as important or maybe more important than roller mill gap. And that was what really was the beauty behind shredlage is that came out with a 50% differential between the two rolls. Whereas conventional rolls at that time were coming out of the factory 21 to you know 25% differential. Now most choppers today are at 40% or more differential. Uh, and, and that really, really improves the, the degree of processing. We can't wait till we're feeding the crop to realize that it wasn't a good job of processing. So um, we developed a corn silage processing cup. And basically it's a liter cup. You just fill it full of corn silage, dump it out, spread it out, pull out every half or whole kernel or a kernel that just had a nick on it. Um, if it comes apart easily than my fingers, I don't pull it out, but you know, just kind of a rough estimate. And if in the liter size, you, you should have less than two whole or half kernels uh, in that. And, and then you, if you were to send it in then for a test, which um, the, the kernel processing test we developed at our lab here at Pioneer, and we gave the protocol to every lab in the country. So whatever lab you send uh, your silage in to look at kernel processing, um, it's done with a ROTAP instrument, which you see in the picture. And it traps um, on the 4.75 millimeter screen, it traps a quarter kernel piece or larger. So what you want to look at on the processing score report, I just happened to print up Dairyland's how theirs looks, but uh, percentage of starch passing through the course screen, it says 69%. I, I like to be somewhere around 70% in terms of my processing score. Does it need to be much higher than that? No. Um, doesn't need to be 80%, doesn't need to be 85%. If you get in that 70% range, um, you're in the sweet spot. And that just shows how the instrument works. 
to be able to push all the silos to all those different sieves. Um, it's really important to look at processing because you know you can you can tell whether you, what kind of job you got by doing some fecal starches at the very end. This is a study we reported at Dairy Science back in 2015, and it just showed that um, we looked at 30, Bill Powell Smith, uh, our dairy specialist in Wisconsin, looked at 32 dairies um, and looked in the, in the high string, they were averaging 106 pounds of milk. And we particle sized every starchy feed on the farm, corn silage, high moisture corn, dry corn, whatever had starch in it, we particle sized it. And then we did fecal, um, fecal scores fecal starch. And you can see all the dairies were below that 3% and many of them were, were below 1%. But the two dairies, 24 and 22, that had 6 and 10% uh, starch in the manure, when we went back and looked, those were the two herds that had really poor kernel processing scores on their corn silage. Point number four, silage is loaded with yeast, which can increase dry matter losses and initiate heating in the pile and the feed bunk. So we know that high moisture corn and corn silage and, and grasses are loaded with yeast. Alfalfa doesn't have hardly any yeast on it. There's some data from Cumberland Valley Laboratories showing uh, the second box to the right with the red, red squares around them is corn silage. And then the one the lower left is corn grain. You can see there's high counts of, of yeast in those products. And therefore, when we use that in the TMR, the bottom right is a TMR. And you get the heating like the picture I took with a uh, thermal sensitive camera down the lower right. Um, so again, how do you how do you really stop yeast in corn silage? And if your crop is stressed at all from drought, there's even going to be higher levels of yeast on it. Um, so it's it's you know basic silage management that I think we're going to be talking about in a in a future uh, uh, episode of this uh, Zoom call. But um, you know we want to pack it well. We want adequate moisture because moisture you know fills in the air spaces. Uh, but again, we can get out to that 38% dry matter and have plenty of moisture for fermentation and good compaction, that three-quarter milk line. Um, but, you know, oxygen barrier film, I feel is a must, especially if we're using drive over piles. And then <clears throat> a, a crop-specific inoculant with, with l buchneri strains in it really, really helps because those uh, l buchneri is a strain that really inhibits yeast growth. So you're almost like you got oxygen barrier film for the face if you're using an l buchneri inoculant. And then the last thing is remember that ruminal starch digestion changes over time and storage. This is some data on both high moisture or corn silage is on the left, high moisture corns on the right, showing what the uh, sciability or starch digestibility is um, in corn silage over time. Corn silage, because the kernels are less mature than it would be in high moisture corn, corn silage will drift up in terms of ruminal starch digestion for about six months or so, and then it'll plateau. High moisture corn, because it's a more mature kernel, will drift up for about a whole year. And the reason that this is important is because if we're feeding old crop corn silage, where we've got, you know, 80% of the starch is digested in the rumen. Now, that's not to say that the rest of it isn't getting digested, because it can be digested in the small intestines. That's why we can look at fecal starches to see, well, it got digested somewhere. <clears throat> but we don't want to, you know, we don't want to underfeed the rumen, nor do we want to overfeed it. But if we're feeding old crop corn silage was, let's say, 80% ruminal starch digestion, and then we go into new crop corn silage, it's going to be much, much, much lower. So we're going to have to actually feed more starch. And that's really why most nutritionists will recommend not feeding new crop, um, you know, until it's been in silo for three or four months. A lot of people say, you know, ideally, what I tell clients is I don't want to see you feed new crop corn silage if you have the inventory until Christmas time. So with that, that's just kind of a quick overview, Gail, um, and look forward to some questions. All right, thanks, Bill. Um, before we get into questions, we're going to hear from the next speaker. So, Fred, did you want to introduce Aaron? I sure can. Uh, Aaron Mostyn is one of the family members who is Mostyn Dairy over at Morris, Iowa. Uh, they milk a herd of Holstein cows. In addition, they feed out some uh, all of their uh, steers and some of their heifers that they don't want to bring back in the, the dairy. Uh, what is exciting when I go there is the detail that I see that feeding system uses. Uh, Aaron, you want to hear more about that detail? Yeah, thanks, Fred. So yeah, just a little bit about myself and our, our operation. Um, I'm fifth generation on our farm, a farm with two brothers and my father. 
Um, we currently yeah, are milking about 1,800 cows and we put up most of our own feed as corn silage, high moisture ear corn and haylage. So focusing on uh, corn silage today with the processing, I wanted to just talk a little bit about what, what we've learned, where we've made mistakes and improved and just uh, yeah, discuss where that can, can be applied for, for anybody. So, um, so yeah, the first thing, uh, you know, for us, we run a, a 970 class with a shear processor in it. Um, we switched to a shear um, last year when we updated machines because we liked the, the size of the rolls. And like you talked about, Bill, the, the differential. So I believe we're at a 40, either 40 or 45 differential. And I think that really helps us to get quality processing. Um, typically we're running in a, at a, uh, for spacing on it, we're at one and three quarter to two millimeter for corn silage. So that's usually adequate if, if moistures are correct on the corn silage between 65 and 68% moisture. So, um, I guess one of the first things that we do on our operation prior to harvest is to go back and evaluate what we did last year at harvest, how that feed performed through the year, what went well, maybe things we could improve. Um, so first looking at, you know, what the feed quality was, how did the inoculant perform that we used, um, both on the face of the silage pile through the year and also at feed out when we put it in the buck, what's the feed temperature, you know, 12 hours after it's laid out. Is that, a, is that an inoculant issue? Is that a, a feed out management issue that can be approved, improved? Um, then we talk about, you know, what were our moisture levels last year when we started and when we finished, finished and how did that positively or negatively affect our feed quality? Um, did we have a large enough crew and equipment to get it done in time? Um, was the weather um, cooperative or was it a challenge and how can we better manage that? So looking at, yeah, we did, that was a big reason that we upgraded last year because we needed to be able to get through the crop faster and have an improved quality because of harvesting at the right moisture. Um, another thing that we look at was the final process score after it's in the pile, you know, we, we do the score, um, you know, as we're bringing the feed in on each field and on each variety, just finding out you know, how many kernels are left in a, in a cup or in a large handful of, of corn silage. So yeah, we shoot for that 70% or better on the final processing score. Um, and I, I kind of have a rule of thumb, if I find more than one whole kernel in a whole cup, it's it's not good enough for me. So we, we tighten it down and, and check it often because it'll, it'll change from field and field to field and variety to variety. So um, another thing we'll look at is, you know, what, what's worn on the machine? Um, I made the mistake a few years ago on a machine. We had approximately 70,000 ton through it. Um, there was a little bit of wear on the rolls and I thought, oh, it'll be good. It'll be good enough for another season. Well, we got through corn silage, all right. And I had good enough processing, but then we went, went right into high moisture ear corn. And usually when you're in the heart of silage, you don't have time to make bigger changes on your equipment. So we just ran it while well, that, we found out how much that costs us to have a worn roll. So we really focus on that. I don't, I don't like to go over 50,000 ton on our rolls. Um, when you run the differential, a lot of times one roll will be more war than the other. So for sure, replacing the, the roll that's worn out quicker than the other. So I watch those close. Um, then the next thing, you know, just planning for harvest, we look at what it is, where we're gonna be going for our first fields, which, what varieties are planted where, what are the maturities, what were the planting dates? How is that going to affect moisture levels on those fields and, and weather. You know, you can have a field that's four miles apart from another field and maybe it missed a couple rains that the other field got. So it's, it has to be a field by field um, 
analysis to find out which ones are going to be first. Um, so yeah, maturity of the varieties is important. Uh, standability, we really look at that because that's going to, you know, even though there's a field that maybe is a little on the wetter side, if there is some root issues or some lodging, we'll go after that first because that, that's the variety that will quickly lose moisture as well. So we want to stay on top of those. Um, also with planning for harvest, uh, I like to start looking, testing samples from fields at three quarter milk line. Um, we will go in and pull three stalks from each, each different variety, um, throw this through a wood chipper. And we use just a, uh, just a air dryer that you, uh, air food fryer that you can purchase at any store. Those work really good for quick burn down and, and testing. Uh, samples. So it's only about a 20 minute process for each one. You can find out where all your fields are, you know, in a half a day's time. And then you're uh, ahead of the ball game with that. Um, also, you know, just is the equipment ready? We focus on, you know, of course, like I said, the processor rolls, but do you have spare belts on hand? Um, I keep a spare processor belt on the machine because I don't like to be down for an hour or two if you have to go find one or go to town to get one. You know, time, time is a big deal during those two or three weeks of harvest and a few hours time is, makes a big difference. So yeah, just being prepared, having equipment prepared, um, have your local dealer help go through things to make sure things aren't war bearings aren't, aren't going to go out. And of course there's always those surprises. So we, we all experience those, but yeah. Um, and then training people, you know, okay, who's the person that's going to go and grab that cup of silage when we pull into a new field? Who's going to get it dried down, report back to the, the guy in the chopper? Um, who makes the decision on who's going to adjust, adjust settings? Um, just communicating that ahead of time so everybody knows what expectations there are. And anyway, you don't go through a whole day and maybe 80 acres or 100 acres later, all of a sudden you realized, oh, yeah, we didn't check it or yeah, we didn't have it adjusted properly. So then, then you quickly, quickly um, can cause a, a costly mistake just by having something not adjusted right. So, um, you know, and then the, the last part is just when it's time to go, you know, when you're going to the field, um, you want to have consistency. So um, just knowing what your crop is that we're bringing in, knowing how the processor is performing on each each, each field and each variety, and just, just watching that closely. Um, the first load is just as important as the last load, I say, and it's, it's easy to get complacent when you're a week into it and everybody's getting tired and, and stressed. And, you know, at that point, everybody's ready to get done. And sometimes the, we let things slide, but we do gotta, do have to keep a focus on that. It's, that it's still quality feed all the way to the end because Always, you could have 40% of your pile. That's not what you really want for the rest of the year. So, um, the other one is, you know, Bill, you had talked a little bit about uh, length of cut and and how dry the the crop is. I I for our operation, we usually shoot for about 22 millimeter when we're at 68% moisture, and like you said, as as it dries just to get consistent pack, we like to adjust it down a little bit. So if we get down to 64, 65, then we'll go down to that 19 millimeter level as that crop dries. So, and I know there's some machines that you can do that on the go and have it adjust for you as you're harvesting, which, which I think is a good feature. So yeah, that kind of just an overview of what what we do and kind of the things that we focus on when we're getting ready to harvest and when we're um, when we are, when we're going at it. So I'm open to questions as well. Great, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I have that I like to ask people when we start digging into a topic like this one is what are your red flags and what are your green flags? So when you're looking, Bill, if you're working with producers or Aaron, if you're, you know, working with your own crew, what are things, what are the big things that kind of strike you like, ah, this, this farm is doing a really good job. I see this green flag here. 
And what are the things that are kind of like, oh, there might be other issues that we need to address. What are your big red flags? I think what Aaron had, what Aaron said that, that struck a chord with me was uh, having people assigned to different tasks. I remember being involved with a very large dairy in Minnesota and I went up to help them. I was, had a meeting between the growers and the dairy. How do we price this corn silage? And um, on the way up, I called the nutritionist and I said, I'm going to go up there and I'll, I'll check the processing when I go up there. And, he, and the nutritionist, who I know well, is a great nutritionist, said, oh, no problem. We have a protocol in place. People are looking at processing. And when I got up there, I went out after a meeting and I took my cup and did a few. And man, I got like 10 or 12 kernels. I said, oh, wow, this is. So I waited for another semi to come in and drop and it did it again. So um, there was nobody assigned to do that job. So, I mean, getting that, getting all that ducks in a row in the beginning. And then to the other thing to, that Aaron said was the consistency. And that's one of the big problems is there's not enough pre-planning in terms of hybrid maturities. How many acres can you plant in a day? How many acres can you harvest? What do we do with changing out, swapping out maturity so that we can try to catch all this as much as possible at three quarter milk line? That's a big difference. You balance a diet with a, with, you know, 32% starch in it and 40% starch in it. That's a big, mm -hmm. big deal. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the neat things that's coming very soon um, is a lot more of these handheld NIRs on the farm so that we can actually monitor the amount of starch in corn silage, you know, you know, e even on a facer. Um, so, I mean, I think, I think that's going to be the next, the next step is to, you know, really helping us monitor when that consistency isn't there. So those are just some top of mind things. Aaron, anything to add to that? I'd say for me that maybe the most obvious red flags that maybe we forget about is how did last year's corn silage really perform? You know, a lot of times, well, it's in the pile. It's we're what's there is there. We have to just deal with it. But yet we don't consider that when we're jumping into the next year's harvest and what what we could do different or try to improve so um watching your your feed at feed out you know it's amazing how you can the the layers of silage in your bunker that you look at when you're defacing and oh yeah i remember that layer that's when we had a two inch rain and we couldn't run for two days and that's you know that and those those samples and those those loads are are mixed in with it for 365 days so it's you know, pay attention to those those things that you can learn from the year before and, and try to make improvements every year. Because the only the only challenge, the only thing I would say to that, Aaron, is there's such a difference in terms of fiber digestibility between one year to the next. Starch, there's not much different. Starch is starch. And after it's yep. been ferment after it's been fermented, there's not there is no differences between hybrids in terms of starch digestibility. Uh, but mm -hmm. fiber digestibility is tremendously influenced by the growing environment. So that's where, you know, to say, you know, for, for me, when I, when I hear dairymen say, well, it's not feeding as good this year, it must be these darn hybrids. And I'm thinking, well, you might want to blame mother nature for some of that, because we know that we know the growing environment's three times more influential on fiber digestibility than, than is the genetics. So that's the only thing to, keep in mind when we're comparing one year to the next, but hopefully your nutritionist is, you know, again, that's one of the reasons I think a lot of nutritionists really want to pull the trigger early on corn silage because they want to say, I want the best fiber digestibility I can get. And I can always add starch to the diet if I need to, but I can't add fiber digestibility. But yeah. that's why, you know, we really worked hard to say, well, yeah, but when, when corn $7 a bushel, the starches has a lot of value in it. And let's not pull the trigger too early if if it's if it's healthy, I was in, I was impressed that you said you you shoot for that three quarter milk line. Um, that's 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 the sweet spot. In fact, you get to markets like California, they'll actually go out the black layer because their plants are so tall. They got so much moisture coming in from the biomass from tall plants, and, and they're a starch deficit state. They got a real in corn, so they'll actually go out the black layer. And as long as that plant's healthy, which it usually is, they don't. You think California would be loaded with corn diseases, but it's not. Um, and, and they can actually harvest quite a bit more mature kernels. Hmm. Yep. So which, Aaron, goes when... to, which goes back to the processing comment. Um, 
people say, well, can you process immature kernels or mature kernels? And the way Aaron's doing is perfect. You, you look at, you get it set. I don't care if it's two millimeters, one milli, you get it set and you look at it periodically. Um, but custom cutters tell me that they actually feel it's, it's actually easier to process more mature kernels because they tend to shatter going through the roller mill as opposed to a softer kernel embedded with all that biomass that can kind of compress and come out and mm. still the pericarp be intact. So, you know, I mean, there's, but, but again, if we, all the new choppers all have a high differential and, and like Aaron said, that's, that's, the, that's the secret. So Aaron, when you're having those discussions about, okay, what went well, what went bad last year, are you, when do you time that? Do you do, are you talking about that right now? Or is that something that you were doing as a team last fall when it was all fresh in everybody's mind or, or both? I would say both because, you know, we considered some of that prior to planting, mm. you know, so selecting varieties and um, which fields we would plant first, you know, which fields will we be, are we going to be chopping for silage, which ones will be delayed for high moisture ear corn. So when that corn is, is ready, depending on what we're going to harvest for, we need to plant according to that. So, and I like to try to use use some of that variance in, in hybrid maturities to help me with harvest, give me a little bit bigger window. Yeah. 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 But it, it's through the through the year as well, as 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 long as well as right now as we consider, you know, you know, do we have the equipment, the labor force, you know, how we know how many hours a day we need to run and to get it done in a in a tight enough window. Aaron, you had uh implied that you've been doing your own cutting for some time. Had you ever worked with a custom harvester? Um, I have done some custom harvesting myself, so, okay. but I have not hired a custom harvester for any corn silage. And so the, the question becomes, what are the expectations you want the producer to tell you when you pull your rig in and open up that field? I would say, you know, the biggest one is, you know, a lot of these newer harvesters, they have moisture sensors on them. So you have information immediately as soon as you're pulling into that field. But that information also needs to be verified by sampling at the pile to find out if their, if their moisture sensor is calibrated correctly on the machine does, you know, just letting them know that you'll be checking the kernels at the pile and you wanna be having a open communication about making those adjustments as, as needed and that that will happen regularly. So just so that there's that expectation, you know, and, and as a custom harvester and, you know, doing custom harvesting at times myself, you know, I wanna be able to do a, a really good quality job with the harvesting because it's, I know how much it can cost a producer if you don't. So I think just having that conversation with your custom harvester and what that value is to you to have the settings correct and, and doing analysis on, on what's actually coming out of the field. And I think that's, that's key. Any advice from either of you? Um, if we have folks who don't have the uh, custom harvester who's quite as um, tuned into a dairyman's needs as, as Aaron is? No, I think part of it is this pre-harvest planning that Aaron talked about. I've been involved with numerous times where, you know, we, we sit down um, and, and we've got the crop manager on the dairy, we've got the custom cutter, we've got the nutritionist, everybody's in the room. So the nutritionist, you know, was really the pulling the lever saying, here's what I want. This is what, this is what I need. Um, and, you know, I think having that custom cutter involved and in, even from planning in, in the beginning. So, you know, kind of, kind of working them into that inner circle because they're such an integral part if you're hiring a custom cutter. And, and I think more and more, I remember, <laughs> I remember having arguments with uh, Dr. Keith, Bolson, bless his soul, he's passed away now. I remember having arguments with Keith from K-State. He spoke uh, at the Western States probably 10 years ago, and he and I were on the same program. And <clears throat> when he finished up, he said, uh, 
I think we're going to see custom cutters dominate the industry. They're going to, they're, people will just all use custom cutters. And as much as I respected Keith, I got up and I said, well, I disagree with you completely, Keith. I think it's going to go the other way. I think it's so important to have control over your harvest that I think more of the big dairies are going to own their own choppers because you've got to take control over it yourself. You just can't wait. And, you know, it's, you know, the, the, the worst thing a custom cutter owns is a cell phone because he's always about a job and a half behind, mm. especially if he gets broken down. And, and that's critical. So I think, and that's why I see I, most of the big dairies today. I mean, you get out West, there's, there's still a lot of custom work, but in the Midwest and in the East, I think it's folks like Aaron have gone out and purchased their own choppers. One thing that might be interesting is actually, Aaron, we, we don't spend a lot of time burning down plants anymore if they're healthy. Mm -hmm. We just look at the kernel milk line because there's such a good range. You guys can pack piles or bunkers very well today. And, and especially you said you're using an inoculant. Um, you know, I think there's quite a range in which those inoculants will, will work as well. I know, I know that to be the fact. Um, so we, we actually are primarily just going out walking fields and breaking years and looking at milk line if the plant's healthy um, as a target. And I was just out in Pennsylvania last week um, and working with some agronomists and we actually have um, the ability now to fly fields with drones and, um, and look at, you know, and we can also use, we're working on trying to get satellite imagery, but we can fly fields with drones to look at them. But we can also pretty well by using weather data, um, calculate for our hybrids anyways, we can calculate with weather data and heat units, we can calculate when that hybrid should hit black layer. Mm. Pretty accurately, we can do that. Um, especially if we know when pollination occurred. We, if we know planting date, we know pollination, we can really pretty accurately say this is when it's going to hit black layer. So then what we do is we back off 150 GDUs and say this is when it should be at three quarter milk line. So not that we're spot on with the actual date that it's going to happen, but what the dairies, especially in the east where I'm from, I grew up in a dairy in upstate New York, we're, we're harvesting lots and lots of small fields. And so we, at least we can sequence the fields at which we will be harvesting or how many fields, you know, how many acres this week will come due and how many acres next week. So I think that's something that's going to increasingly be available to, to growers as well that I think would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we'll get to the point of satellite imagery where we can look at the health of that plant. And, and then if we can determine milk layer, I think it'll save us, save us some, some legwork of burning things down eventually. Well, what are you going to have your interns do then? Yeah, right. Yes. Well, we always got other other things like yeah. walking fields and looking for tar spot. Let's hope yeah. tar spot <laughs> stays in Wisconsin and not over here in Iowa. Yeah. Well, that brings me to another question that I had. You know, you mentioned for dry plant or for healthy plants, dry matter is not as much of a consideration for you. When is there any time that is it just when a plant is unhealthy that it's useful to measure dry matter before harvest? to you, Bill, or is it, are, are there other reasons oh, that you yeah, might want to yeah. be monitoring that? If it's, if it's not very healthy, I, I think, I think so. Um, one thing that I think uh, this drought zoom, zoom that I did yesterday for Eastern Nebraska, people don't realize, for example, in, in stressed crops, or if we have poor pollination or we have drought, it's, it's the grain that dries down the plant. You can take droughted corn and chop it and burn it down in a coster cooker and put it in your or put it in a microwave, or, um, and it'll be amazing. It'll be 68, 70 percent moisture because even though the leaves look, you know, dried up and it looks like broomsticks standing in the field, that stalk has a lot of moisture in it, and it's really the starch deposition through kernel development that dries the whole gamish down. So yeah, anytime a plant is stressed, like last year, Gail at World Dairy Expo. When tar spot really hit southern Wisconsin big time, I mean, tar spot killed those plants in seven days. They were yeah. dead. That that's dangerous, you know. That that we got to get in there and chop because, again, to Darren's point, we can't we can't pack it then, you know. So yeah, if the plant is stressed, so I I always try to point out it's healthy plants that I'm talking about. But you're right, dry matters would be important to look at if if there was something odd going on. And that's really the only time that you care about it. Yep. I don't know if Aaron's that brave. 
We've had this. So last year, I actually had this experience. We, you know, it was a drier summer up here in Northwest Iowa. And we were surprised a little bit because the milk line was at three quarter and we went out and did some sampling and oh my, we have some 68%. You know, the, the plants were, were dying down, but the, the kernels were, were still wet yet. So, so yeah, then, you know, you have, you have to weigh those options and, and look at what your weather is, is going to be like in the next couple of weeks to know what is our window and, yeah. and make those adjustments. So I always like to be ahead of the game instead of behind. Like yeah. you said, it's, it's not much fun when you when you start harvest three days behind. So then you're behind the whole way. So, so Aaron, you said you um, you must put a snapper head on your on your chopper and you're putting up snaplage or that I call it snaplage earlage. Um, yep. So tell me, I was interested. You said the roller mill. When the year the last year when it was worn out, um, it did it didn't process the kernels on the snaplage the way you wanted it. Is that the problem? No, it just through the season as it continued to wear, and then then in ear corn we we tightened the processor down to about three quarter millimeter. Yeah. Well, because of that wear, maybe certain spots of the rolls were three quarter, but other spots were one and a quarter. So then we couldn't get adequate processing in the ear corn. Yeah. And then, and then it, it's even, the processing, processing is even more critical there because yeah, your kernels are drier and yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Especially in, tends to wear more in the middle where you got more of the feed going through it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So Aaron, as you're looking ahead to this coming harvest season, what's keeping you up at night? What are you, what are you thinking about right now in terms of challenges that are coming up for this year? Well, right now for us, it's it's the heat and and the dry weather here. This this corn is is going to keep being stressed. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're we're into August here, and you know, we've we've harvested silage as early as the fifteenth of August here on drier years. So, we're we're getting close to that. So we'll keep watching it, and hopefully, we have some nice rains in the next few weeks to to extend the health of these plants all the way until the 1st of September. But yeah, we'll, we'll keep watching it. Yeah. I heard a good comment from our agronomist in Nebraska yesterday. There was a question, well, you know, when should I, in droughty corn, when should I go in and take it? And, and Jerome, maybe you can confirm this uh, from your experience, but uh, um, he said, if you, you know, we know the leaves are going to roll during the heat, he said, but at night, hopefully it'll, it'll unfurl a little bit. But he said, if you get up in the morning, seven o'clock and you walk out in the cornfield and those leaves are still rolled up, he goes, that plant's on its way out. And I thought that was kind of a pretty good thumb roll. But you don't have the drought. You don't have a, your crop looks pretty decent this year, Aaron, right? You're saying? Yeah, we're, Right now it's looking, I'd say it looks as good as I've seen anywhere. Yeah, Bill, you're spot on. I mean, uh, a lot of times some of those real jolty plants, and Aaron, you mentioned the two, sometimes you think there's gonna be very, very little moisture in them. And then you uh, chop some up and run a moisture test and it blows people away. Yeah. How much moisture is in there, but no, Bill, you're spot on. Thanks for the comment. Bill, what are you seeing for mycotoxin potential for this year? I don't think it's going to be a big deal. I mean, I think it depends where, where we're talking. Here in Iowa, no, I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal. The plants look relatively healthy. Uh, you get into Nebraska where it's really dry. I think there could be more of a potential. Frankly, I think mycotoxins are not as big of a deal as what everybody thinks they are. I, you know, on my team, I have a, Dr. Adam Krull is a veterinarian who's very knowledgeable about it, was, ran the microbiology lab at the Iowa State Vet School. And um, we just don't, you know, everybody talks about mycotoxins when cows aren't milking the way they should, we blame mycotoxins. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> it's really, it's really a complicated subject. You know. Well, it's so tricky, right? Because there's so many of them, and and yeah. you're 
they're hard to test for because you'll yeah. have hot spots and non hot spots and yeah there's it's hard to wrap your arms around yeah i think i think there's a, a lot more issues around understanding what the fiber digestibility is and what the kernel processing is and that the starch digestibility changes over time and all of those things that nutritionists are starting to really pay a lot of attention to um you know that rumen is pretty evolved <laughs> And pretty adept at breaking things down. And I just don't see it. You know, I mean, I remember talking to a researcher from Peoria, USDA researcher from Peoria. And they said, you know, a lot of times, you know, you know, all the work on binding agents and all that kind of stuff, a lot of these will be chelated. And then what they'll happen is they will, when they get to the low um, pH of the, of the rumen, they'll, they'll come apart. And then there's, there's a bit of a problem, but, you know, I, I'm not, I know that a lot of the labs are, you know, really, you know, pushing it and, and there's companies that really push it that are trying to sell uh, binding agents and, and remediation, but I don't know. Well, we can't I call do, them binders though. Right. Yeah. <laughs> that's illegal to, for a nutritionist to do that. Yeah. Yes, I understand. <laughs> I mean, I know there, I know, um, you know, the, the labs test it. When we have samples that we suspect something might be going on, Gail, so that we check every box, you know, we send samples to the Iowa State Vet School and, and get a, get our profile done. But I mean, many times we just don't see a big problem. And if we're, you know, the other thing is, just so folks know, no inoculant in the world is going to stop mycotoxins. 90% of any mycotoxin is on the crop before it ever goes in the pit. It's already there. And you can't do anything about it. Fermentation isn't gonna isn't going to reduce the level like it does nitrates. They're still going to be there. And you know the you know the point is, you know, good management, packing, keeping air away from it. We're we're back to the yeast that I said, especially in a stress plant. Yeast will eat lactic acid, and when the lactic acid level is raised, then the pH comes up, and then nasty organisms can begin to grow. But fungi, mold spores cannot grow without oxygen. So if we're doing a really good job of packing and we're doing a good job of facing, you know, we're keeping oxygen away from that. So the only thing, and, and the other thing is low pH. The only uh, penic penicillin will grow down to a pH of about 3.8. So penicillium, if there's oxygen, is something that can grow in silages. But most of the, most of the mold balls in that we may see in silages, none of those are producing a toxin. First of all, they have to, those spores have to go vegetative, they have to grow, then, then they have to produce a toxin. Um, and so, I don't know, you'll, you'll find people that'll completely disagree with me that it's a big, big, big issue, but I think I'd check on what they're selling first before I got to it. <laughs> yeah. Right now, right, like, mycotoxins that are there are going to be there. The weather that we have is going to be the weather that we have. Like we're kind of the hybrids that we planted are the hybrids that we planted. So if you're talking to producers right now, um, you know, people that, that watch this, that are here tonight or that watch this when you post it, what are the things that they should be thinking about and they should be doing um, in the near future as we're looking to um, our harvest here in a few weeks? Well, walk the fields, you know, walk the fields. You know, you got to walk the string of cows to know what's going on. You got to walk a cornfield to know what's going on. So I would say, you know, talk to your agronomist or your crop guy or get out and do it yourself. And most dairymen are too busy, got too many things to do. Um, but you got to have somebody assigned to, like Aaron said, and try to try to figure out when it's time to go and then get ready to go. Yeah. I think that's key, just having that communication ahead of time and I like, if I can get my nutritionist to come out the first day that we start chopping silage, and you know, if, if we open a few fields, you know, have some different samples to look at, look at it together. And of course you discuss ahead of time what the plan is, but when you're, when you're in there and the first feed's coming in and, and just looking at it and see what can be, can be changed. That's, there's a lot of value there, I think. Yeah, back to that team approach, you know. Yeah, get the nutritionists out there right away right, right as you har during harvest. Yeah, that's that's a great idea. Uh, Aaron, maybe you mentioned it, but do you do you have a, a 
a crop consultant on your team of people that you work with? We do. Yep, we've a, we have an agronomist that we work with. I'm yeah. going to take a little bit of a step to the right here. We've got a question that came in. Are there any management tips for someone who's switching from silage bags to silage piles that you think number one thing they need to consider? Well, don't build it like the Californians. Sorry <laughs> if anybody from California is listening. Build it um, so that you drive over it every which direction. That's really, really important. Now in California, the piles are so big that they can get away with the way they build them out there, but that's not the way in the Midwest or the East that typically we're not putting up that amount of silage. So, you know, so we drive over that every which way. And then I'm just a firm believer in oxygen barrier film, um, especially to protect those tails of the pile. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's to me, that's two big important things. Because you you know we're using mechanical, and, and you have the adequate number of pack tractors. Um, you know you need two push you need two pack tractors and one push tractor at least at a minimum for every self propelled chopper. That's a minimum. Um, and you know we've been if you're in a bag you're using mechanical force to get compaction. Well, when we move to a a pile, we got to provide it with tractors, and make sure you know make sure we have adequate pack tractor capacity. Do you have piles or bunkers, Aaron? We have, we have bunkers, some piles that we use for, but not for corn silage. Corn silage is only bunkers. Okay. So yeah, like, like you said, the vapor barrier, you know, now they have great roles where you can get the vapor barrier already attached to the tarp. So it simplifies putting it on. Um, the other thing with switching from bags to piles, you know, what is your feed out? How much are you taking off that face of that bag per day? And if you go to a pile, depending on the dimensions of your pile, what size is your feed on and will you be taking enough silage off that each day if you have a larger face? Uh, that'll be a big, big one. Yeah, that's a really good point. And then the other thing they'll notice probably is more consistent silage because when you go through a bag, you're going through, you know, 12 foot, 14 foot, whatever, you're going through discrete areas. Whereas with a fate, you're facing a big bunker, especially if we're building it, you know, the way we build them or a pile, we can, as we face it, we're kind of averaging everything out. Um, and, and it'd be probably a more consistent corn silage. For sure. Yeah. So Bill, you talked about yeast um, and you, you know, mentioned the importance of an oxygen barrier for yeast and an inoculant, a buchner inoculant for yeast. Anything else? What happens when we're feeding that high yeast corn silage? Well, it's no problem to the cows and, you know, the yeast will produce ethanol, which cows can digest very easily, can digest ethanol. Um, it's just the fact that you set up yourself to have heating. That's when Aaron said he tested, looked at his inoculant, uh, not only on the face of the pile, but also in front of the cows. That's, that's really good because that's what you're hoping you're getting. You know, if you've got, you know, 20 pounds of dry matter corn silage in a whole TMR and you're using a Buchner inoculant, it'll tend to pretty much keep that whole TMR fresh. It'll stop the yeast growth and, and, and that. And so I know a lot of guys that are, as we trend to higher and higher corn silage based diets, um, you know, the problem is there's a lot of sugar in that corn silage too. And so that's a nutrient source for spoilage organisms to grow on. So if we can keep that pH low in front of the cows, um, which, you know, which a Buchner will help to do because it's inhibiting the yeast, it keeps that feed a lot fresher. And, and to me, that's, that's really important. In fact, I take my thermal sensitive camera and I'll take pictures of the, of the, face of the pile, but I'll also go over and take pictures of the feed bunk too. I don't want that heating in, in there as well. So it's really, it, it'll, and it, you know, it can save you some money too, because, you know, you don't have to really be spending 10 cents a cow a day to put a TMR saver in the, into the, or some sort of propionic acid product into the TMR, uh, you know, during the summer, especially because usually that corn silage will, will hold the rest of the TMR. I don't know if that's been your experience, Aaron, with how fresh it stays in front of cows, but. 
Yeah, because your corn silage is your biggest percent of your ration. So that, that can make or break yep. your, your TMR. I would not be spending money on a buchanoi inoculant for alfalfa. Um, <laughs> there are there are not very many yeast on alfalfa. It's it's, uh, it's really not worth it. So we've talked a lot about the team approach and the, and the importance of the people um, and the people and the training and and making sure everybody's on the same page. Um, and we all talk on a couple of these webinars too about the importance of safety. Um, but I think it's worth talking about more than once. Um, so what do you do to ensure the safety of the employees um, during this, during corn silage harvest? You know, it's planning and just talking about, you know, the process, you know, the, the times when accidents can happen is, you know, it's dark, somebody's backing up to the pile and don't, they don't notice the guy that's on the pile pulling the sample or, you know, just communicating all those different scenarios and so that everybody's aware of, of, of the potential for things to go wrong. So, um, you know, oftentimes we're, we're in equipment, so we're, we're somewhat protected, but there's also safety things for sure, you know, with equipment, with trucks going on and off roads, um, following rules of the road, you know, it, obey stop signs don't don't be rolling through them all at, at 20 mile per hour you know um, pay attention to take your time when you're going in and out of driveways uh, when you're backing up uh, you know just just a lot of those things that can potentially cause an accident so and you know as we've when we've done it over the years we've we've all experienced those two hopefully not um, accidents but close calls or you know things where that that we want to be paying attention to. Another thought I had with safety is after it's in the pile, but when we <clears throat> go up on these large piles and we're pulling the plastic back, um, that's kind of a kind of a dangerous thing to do. Sometimes they can avalanche down, and um, the uh, I, uh, there's a dairy in Wisconsin that I learned this. They were building a new freestall barn, and the guys working on the Raptors had all these har harnesses on, so mm -hmm. if they fall, it catches them. And that's what they've started to have their employee put the harness on and then it's a, to a cable back to a post, you know, they stick it in the, in the, the pile and then, you know, they'll take that over when they move it back. But um, it, it saved two of their people falling off, falling off about a 30 foot face from hitting the ground. It caught them. So I think, you know, watching that, being careful when we're pulling plastic back is really important as well. By the way, Aaron, I, um, before you got on, uh, Gail and Fred uh, told me that they were coming out to help you cover your piles this year as kind of reward uh, for you being on the Yeah, we didn't talk about what Aaron was going to pay us. <laughs> so you'll have some extra help covering that pile. Uh, uh, thank you, Bill. We yeah, you're welcome. Your <laughs> job security for me. <laughs> Yeah, um, Aaron brings up a good point about the oxygen barrier film. So there's two types now. You can put, you can buy the oxygen barrier film and then use normal six mil plastic. Or you can, a um, number of companies, I know Raven Industries is one of them that has a product that it's embedded into the, into the plastic. Uh, it's all in one, which is a lot easier when you're trying to cover a pile. Um, and one thing to be careful of, though, if you do that one step approach is that you really have either pea gravel bags or tires all along the front face so that we don't get any air going underneath that and, and billowing into the silage mass. That is one advantage to this two-step approach because, you know, if you get air underneath that six mil plastic, still that oxygen barrier film is going to be protective. But it's really important to have a, a and I like pea gravel bags rather than tires on the front, but, and I'm not a big believer that you need tire to tire to tire to tire on a pile either. Um, you, you, but uh, you know, just making sure that front face is really protected so that we don't get air moving underneath there. You know, it's a typical academic speaking, Aaron. You know, that doesn't have to go out and put that silent the the thin plastic down when the wind's blowing twenty miles an hour. That's not a fun job, I know. Yep. That's why that one step has been quite popular. Yeah, for sure. So we're rounding out now at a little more than an hour. 
Um, and I have kind of a different question for you guys. Uh, what is the smallest hill you'll die on? Like, what's the thing that seems very minute when you're when you're thinking about all the problems that you'll have, but is kind of a make or break? Like the thing that a lot of people tend to forget, but is really something that that just kind of makes the whole thing work that often gets overlooked. Well, I think it's a processing back to what this was about. I think a lot of times people aren't taking the time and effort that Aaron is doing to check. You know, I, I on our cup, we say check every third load, um, you know, but, uh, you know, people just don't don't check it. And then like that dairy in Minnesota that, you know, everybody thought somebody else was doing it. And so imagine what that's going to do to cows in terms of consistency mm -hmm. when you go into that portion of that bunker where, and, and the custom cutter, I went out and talked to him. He goes, oh, I was in a really immature field last night. I opened up the roller mill and I didn't close it down. I mean, he, he wanted to do a great job. He just kind of forgot to close it down. You know, if somebody was paying attention. So to me, I don't know if it's a small hill, but, you know, we worry about moisture. We worry about maturity. We worry about pack tractor capacity. We worry about all that stuff. That, that kernel processing is really, really important because if that pericarp if that pericarp is still intact, it, it, the starch digestibility is not going to change and it's going to be low. And unless that cow bites that kernel with her teeth and it moves down, and, and I think, you know, I, I think to me, that's the hill I would talk about. Aaron? I think I'm going to agree with that. You know, it only takes two minutes, maybe max, to get out of the machine and adjust the processor. So I think most custom guys are going to, they're willing to do that, but they need to have the information because if, if he's in the machine, he has no idea what's coming out of the truck on the pile. Um, and sometimes it can surprise you. You know, you might, you might have your settings where you would have it on almost every field and you get into a certain field or variety and right. it's not adequate. So, yeah. Uh, if, if we have time, I'll share a little story about, uh, I, I think, you know, hemorrhagic bowel syndrome, we call it a syndrome because we don't know what causes it. But I think the reason we're not seeing that today, like we saw it 10 years ago. And, you know, we're, you know, it's your best cow, your biggest eater, your best doer. You know, she, she goes down with a bloody gut and she's dead overnight. Um, and I've been involved in enough situations where, People, it was a large dairy in Kansas I worked with probably 10 years ago. The nutritionist asked me to go down and look at it. And they'd had a bunch of people down there, veterinarians. And I got showed up at the dairy and the dairyman said, you want to walk the cows? And I said, no, I'm, I don't need to walk the cows. And he goes, well, what do you hear? What do you want to look at? I go, take me out to your corn silage pile. And they were losing like 15 cows a day, the hemorrhagic bowel syndrome. And so... I went out to the corn silage pile with my cup and I did it and I pulled out about 10 kernels. I go, there's your problem right there. Um, and I think the reason that go, we see bouts of it, you know, in, in some big dairies is I said, how many choppers did you have working to fill this huge pile? He goes, oh, there's three choppers. I go, were you checking the kernel processing on the three? No, no, we didn't ever check that at all. I go, well, that's where we go into these situations where we'll get into a, you know, maybe two of the choppers were set up right. Or like Aaron said, you get into a different field, a different hybrid. You know, they all process just a little bit differently, uh, depending on the maturity of the kernel. And, and uh, so anyways, I said, you know, that's that's the issue. And then then that undigested starch gets down to the hind gut and all of a sudden Clostridia or Aspergillus, whatever's causing the problem, start to grow, produce toxins and we get this bloody gut. But we don't see that as much today, I think, because the whole industry and and the way choppers are designed today, we're just doing such a better, better job. If you look at the data from uh, Cumberland Valley and Rock River and, and Dairyland Labs, and, and you look at the data for their corn silage processing scores, man, it used to be like half of the samples that came in had below a 50 for a kernel processing score. Now it's all skewed to the right. I mean, everybody's doing a fantastic job today. And, and I think that for that reason, we don't see as much hemorrhagic bowel syndrome as what we used to. Uh, it's a good note to kind of start wrap up and wrapping up on. Um, you know, it's corn silage harvest when you look at 365 days in the year, it's really a small percentage of all of those, but we're feeding corn silage all year. You know, just like you said, Arian, it's the biggest part of your TMR. 
Um, so I think uh, really great discussion points we've had tonight, just in terms of being having that detail orientation kind of taking, I know it's an exhausting few days, um, but making sure that we're um, being as detail oriented and as conscientious as possible during that time, because it's what's going to pay off for the rest of the year for our cows. So anything else to any other questions, Fred? No, I, I think you kind of closed up the program. I mentioned again, and you know, I, I'm the guy who always talks about safety. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's somebody tired, somebody's dehydrated, somebody's hungry, running that truck back and forth till four in the morning. Those are things that can cause huge problems. Yeah. So being safe, uh, not just around the pile, but with the equipment. Uh, my dad was the greatest. We had a New Holland two-row chopper, and that old bird had every safety panel off of that <laughs> so we could get to the problems faster. Yeah. They're there for a reason. Yeah. And, you know, I, I want to see as we move into the silage harvest that folks in my part of the world and across the country are uh, being safe and I don't read about any disasters. 